All right, so when talking about Percy Crosby, where do you start? He was born in 1898 in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, I mean, he he, he was, um, you know, he was the He's the child of um, of immigrants, um, and um, his dad opened a, a paint supply shop, and that's kind of where kind of he got started. So he was out in kind of a part of Long Island that um, would become kind of suburbanized um, during the course of his youth, but was pretty darn rural um, uh, and kind of small town idyllic when he was growing up. Um, and he had, you know, he had access to paint supplies, um, and, uh, his, his, I think it was his father, I should read my own intros, but I think it was his father and his uncle, this is, that was four volumes ago, so it's a little hazy, who opened this business together. I think his father even, like, patented some, some supplies along the way, um, you know, moderately successful, by no means, um, did, did they ever become big business, but, you know, he, he, as he grew up and grew kind of wealthy and famous, he idealized um, this childhood, but he kind of stripped out the kind of immigrant experience out of it. Like for mm -hmm. the kind of version of it that he kind of recreated in Skippy um, in 1925, kind of lost the part of Long Island that, um, you know, was a, a real kind of amalgam of smaller immigrant communities um, and, uh, certainly kind of erased his parents' own Irish experience. Um, they, you know, they themselves um, were escaping kind of brutal poverty in, in Ireland. I think they were somewhere in County Cork. I don't remember exactly where I could look it up. Um, and, you know, like not surprisingly, given that background, he grew up uh, kind of became as he went off and began um, kind of pursuing a career in art, and he really aspired in some ways more than being a cartoonist, he aspired to be a, a fine uh, artist. Um, but, you know, cartooning, I think initially for him was um, a, a kind of means to make a living because he was obviously like, you know, like most kids of immigrants, desperately needed to get a job really early. So one of his first jobs actually was at a socialist paper. and. He, his politics were pretty left early on. He worked for a socialist paper. And he did some really intense um, uh, comics. I'll, I think there's a couple in volume one. I sent you a PDF of volume one. Um, there's a couple of examples of it. Unfortunately, I've only ever been able to see them on microfilm. So the quality isn't great, but the, the cartooning is pretty remarkable um, about you know the kind of horrific exploitation and and murder of workers. Um, he was, you know, it was, it was, the work was too good to just be work for hire. Like he was clearly um, for a while, a real believer. Um, and, you know, he remained part of what got me fascinated about Crosby from the start is that kind of transformation, which is not unique. A lot of people went through this transformation during this period of the twenties and thirties from being um, kind of socialist to being Kind of on the hard right. Um, John Dos Passos, for example, went through that transformation. Um, uh, and I've always been, I guess I've been kind of fascinated by folks who whose politics can change so radically. Um, and he, in fact, he was a supporter of FDR in his first election, in, in the first um, of the four elections. He was a, a keen supporter of FDR and would go on to become one of FDR's kind of arch nemesis. Um, uh, and although a lot of the enmity was in Crosby's brains, FDR hated him too. Like it was actually mutual. So um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of pretty dramatic um, uh, transformation. And- Do you think um, it's, like, it's, it's possible that he started working for that leftist newspaper just because he was hungry for work and that was a, a newspaper that would hire him. And so he just kind of was like, no, I think he was, I mean, I think he, I don't think he was a socialist, but I think he was on the, he was on the progressive left at the time. He also worked for um, Theodore Dreiser's um, kind of reformist um, magazine at the time. Like he was, he was very plugged in. And in some ways, even as his politics shifted, you know, 360 degrees, um, uh, he, he remained kind of deeply concerned with and engaged with um, the issues uh, related particularly to 
uh, those who were young and uh, in various ways kind of dispossessed. So even after his hard turn to the right, he was deeply committed to raising money, for example, for um, underprivileged children. Um, uh, so he kind of, I think he saw in some ways some more connections between his concerns and his issues. I think he really believed in this stuff. I think, you know, I think it's a combination of factors. I think one, he got rich, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. know, sadly, a lot of people's politics change when their tax brackets change. And yeah. back then, of course, you know, the um uh the the kind of there were there were fewer loopholes for the wealthy to hide behind as there are now where they can um, kind of bury uh, much of their wealth um, in, in various instruments that didn't exist in the 20s and 30s. Um, but also, I think that's a, a little bit cynical. I think the other issue is he became, and this is something I think happens to a lot of guys, um, he became, as he became more and more divorced from the kind of city and the site of his youth, he became increasingly a nostalgicist. He began to kind of deeply kind of fetishized this idea of small town America, um, mm -hmm. what we would later call a kind of Norman Rockwell version of America. And mm -hmm. uh, he, anything that he thought was a threat to that, he began to um, kind of see not just as something dangerous, but even as something that was part of a conspiracy. And this is the other factor that's part of his story that makes it really interesting is that there was um, it was real um, mental illness uh, combined with alcoholism. So um, he, was, he was mentally ill. He sure, yeah, no, for sure. Um, uh, it was, you know, I think it was it was mental illness. Again, we don't really have a diagnosis. I would say, you know, from reading a whole, reading, you know, pretty much everything he ever wrote, my, you know, there's definitely paranoia in there. Um, there's definitely um, uh, an inclination towards conspiracy theory. Um, of course, there was also, you know, as often is the case, right, there was also reasons for him to be paranoid and some reasons to yeah. see conspiracy. So um, when he, he was, was sober, sober, he became he became paranoid because he was being wasn't he being bugged by the CIA or something or his, his yeah. tax audits and all this stuff. He became an enemy of the government. He became well that yeah I mean the the tax audits and um, that I mean that came that came after so yeah. I mean part of the story I kind of worked to try and reconstruct in my in my version of the biography was kind of where and how do things start falling apart for him because part of the horrible story for me is this is the most I think he's the most talented um, uh, I think just for me personally, the, the work of of the kind of from 25 up through, you know, 33, I don't think there's work comparable to it in newspaper cartooning during that period. Um, I think it's 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 funny. It's smart. The kids are believable. It, it introduces issues of philosophy and spirituality and politics. It's it's peanuts before peanuts there's a reason schultz would often kind of cite the influence of uh of skippy because here was a comic that on one hand was truly about kids but was also about kids who really did they experienced depression they experienced existential dread they experienced the terrors of mortality they went through real experiences um he got into environmentalist issues mm -hmm. um it was it was just I mean, it was smart and nobody could draw faster and yeah. better. There was just such an energy to his line in the early years. I heard, um, I heard it, that he, him and his assistant like would do like a year's worth of strips in like five months. Yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. And then and then he would just chill. Right. I mean, he was <laughs> and he would when he when he ran out of material, he would go into the city and just kind of walk the streets looking at kids um, he was a keen observer of the world around him. Um, the period in particular when, you know, he, in his early years of success, um, what had been kind of social uh, drinking uh, got out of hand. And I think it was the first period he realized that he had a problem with alcohol. So, um, you know, he stopped drinking um, uh, by uh, the end of the 20s, um, kind of really at the height of his 
success as the, as the strip was really taking off. He stopped drinking. Um, you know, his first marriage had already fallen apart. He stopped drinking, and um, and really the the kind of level of work and the productivity just was amazing. I mean, there are stories of him in the in his kind of jazz age days when he, he was jet setting around that were pretty. I'm sure some of them are urban legends, but like stories of him, you know, going drinking in in New York and ending up in a railway depot in Cleveland. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I don't know how many of them are true, but I mean, they would get even in the gossip columns. You know, his friend Oh McIntyre would regularly report about him. Um, in he was the a 20s. real celebrity. Yeah, he was. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He and he, he after his first marriage fell apart, he was seen in the company of many of the kind of important celebrities and socialites of the day. He was, he was, you know, he was um, like a lot of cartoonists. And I think we forget about this so easily because it's so hard to imagine today. There was a real period in the 20s, really 20s through the 30s. It starts to fade after the 30s. But 20s and the 30s, the, the highest paid cartoonists were making an immense amount of money. Um, and, you know, Crosby was not the highest, um, probably the, probably the highest paid. I mean, there's, there's lots of debates about, it. I mean, certainly one of them was Sidney Smith, somebody you and I have talked about before yeah. of the Gumps, um, who got the first official $1 million contract. And died uh, right on the way home. Is that true? Or? Died, died on the way home. Yes, no, that's, that's true. Um, <laughs> that's terrible. He, he got a million dollar contract and a new Rolls Royce and then, um, he, he he liked to drive really fast and drink yeah. while he drove. Um, no, these he's guys so were jet set. He's so great. Yeah, I mean, Bud Fisher, you know, basically like the minute he um, kind of established Mutt and Jeff, he pretty much kind of farmed it all off to ghosts and just like jet set it around. Like he yeah. was, you know, he was, um, I don't, he did not do a lot of Mutt and Jeff writing or drawing. Um, after the first decade or so, but he lived high on a hog. I, didn't, um, I need to look into to uh, Bud Fisher. I don't know that much about him. Yeah, I I I mean it was it was Eddie Campbell who first. Um, I had a I had a um, Mutton Jeff kicking around my house, and he was over, and he looked at it, and he goes, "Oh, that's not by Bud Fisher." And oh. I got indignant for a second, and then I looked at it more closely. I was like, "Yeah, you're right. That's not by Bud Fisher." Yeah, and and that was from like twenty. 122 so um you know poking around a bit i realized oh yeah he he was he was off gallivanting much more than he was in the studio um well, now that was not that yeah. was not crosby crosby took his work seriously but as you said everybody marveled at the speed of his uh pen like he's the kind of guy who could um you know he he worked without pencils much of the time he worked directly on to bristol board uh or its equivalent and, you know, that energy in his line is part of what gave Skippy such a kind of crackle to it. Um, it unfortunately, by the by the 40s and the last years of the strip, it becomes very stiff, very um, static. It loses a lot of that life and energy. I heard a story about how he was out drinking with one of his buddies. And you probably know this. And he realized that he still had to do six, he had to do a week's worth of Skippy strips he forgot to do. So he just like did them real fast, like while he was out drinking. Yeah, on a bench, like he stopped at a bench or something like that. Yeah, there's no there. I mean, he was he was legendary um, uh, both for his, um, you know, his his speed and his ability to just kind of come up with ideas for strips and for his um, ability to drink anybody under the table. But, you know, I mean, to his credit, like he was like, I need to turn my life around. And he did. Right. He he got he got sober. He, he really dedicated himself to, um, uh, uh, kind of focusing on his strip and to making something more of the strip. So he kind of, after he kind of, uh, particularly after he settled down into, in Virginia, which is kind of where his kind of next stage of his life kind of begins. He leaves the kind of whole world of New York behind. He becomes really invested in being a Virginian. Um, obviously this is an Irish, kid from Long Island, and now he wants to be, you know, a kind of jodhpurs wearing aristocrat from Virginia, right? So there's a little bit of, you know, it's, again, it's something we see a lot in the 20s and 30s. If you look at kind of 
you know, people like Eric von Stroheim in Hollywood, this kind of Jewish immigrant from Austria who starts riding around, walking around with a kind of whip and calling himself, uh, you know, Count von Stroheim. Um, there was no bond in his name originally. I mean, it's a period of self-invention. It's a period of, um, uh, you know, particularly for those who are aspiring after fame and wealth of a kind of I idealizing this kind of pre-modern America. Um, and he really gets into that, right? So he becomes kind of living on his horse farm, um, which he bought with his immense amount of money. He becomes kind of incredibly invested in this idea of uh, a kind of America before modernity. Um, and at first that that's not, doesn't really fundamentally change his politics, but it begins to change the politics or the kind of worldview of the strip, it becomes um, kind of much more explicitly. I mean, if you look at the 25 to 28 Skippy, you know, the the space he's living in feels feels like a line, long, like Long Island. It feels like, you know, the city is just over there. Um, by the time you get to the end of the 20s and the 30s, that that world of Skippy's childhood feels very much like a kind of pastoral ideal. Um, it's there's the kind of city is is banished into the distance. Um, and actually, he writes these Skippy novels during this same period, um, uh, one called Skippy and one called Suki. Um, and they're, in, you know, entirely kind of imagining a, a a kind of Skippy's world as as you know a kind of small town kind of version of you know kind of Tom Sawyer right he's been transported into a kind of timeless space outside of the forward march of American progress mm -hmm. and I think that's the kind of seeds of his kind of turn towards a kind of initially just a kind of old fashioned nostalgic conservatism before he starts getting paranoid anti communist. Um, and uh, begins picking very expensive fights with FDR, which comes a little bit later, really after FDR's, um, uh, after the beginning of the New Deal begins to be put into place. Um, but, you know, it's, I think one of the things that I kind of love about Crosby is that during this period, he is, he knows he has demons, right? He knows there's alcoholism. I think he, you know, I think he's aware that, you know, he's got one of those kind of brains that's kind of constantly like on fire. Alcohol mm -hmm. was a kind of form of self-medication for him back before we had ways of dealing with kind of anxiety and depression or bipolarism or schizophrenia or whatever he was suffering from. It was something that today would have been medicated and, and he would have been um, no doubt a highly functional member of society. Um, I know his, his family is very hostile to the idea that there was any mental illness, but, um, and I get that, um, but, well, how um, you, you know. Uh, just from your research, you, you came to the conclusion that he was mentally ill? Yeah, I mean, it's it's my research. It's, you know, living with mental illness in my own family and my own life. Um, it's it's listening, kind of just listening to him. The best way of putting it is listening to him explain himself to himself and to the world. In yeah. particularly the writings that I cover in volume three, um, that's volume three and volume four is when things start to really kind of begin to unravel. Um, Let me just and, mention that you're talking about this series. Uh, it'll, yeah. Can I even show it? Oh my God, look at this. <laughs> look, at look at I'm invisible now. Oh, that's so cool. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even promote it. All right, never mind. I'll have to put it up somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I mean, basically, I mean, you know, I, I think once his second marriage falls apart, he returns to drinking. And when he returns to drinking, he also begins to unravel in ways that aren't fully explained by alcoholism. Um, that that is, um, I, I think he's drinking. I don't think, but he wasn't drinking like he used to. That is, he's not not ending up in Cleveland, you know, railroad depots. Um, but he's he's drinking and he is writing, and he is writing not Skippy. He is writing these. Um, manifestos, um, his political writings and manifestos, which initially were published, um, but 
um, quickly become unpublishable. Um, they become uh, too vicious, too personal um, about uh, government officials. Um, his publishers begin to drop him. King Feature somehow um, hangs on for as long as they did. It's kind of a miracle because he's becoming more and more of a liability. Newspapers start to drop him uh, in part because um, he's his strip is becoming less and less funny as he's putting more and more um, uh, kind of anti-communist um, and anti-FDR rhetoric into his strips. But also, more importantly, because he is um, ex himself explicitly targeting newspapers with uh, ads that he is purchasing, uh, full page ads uh, that are kind of replacing his former uh, printed manifestos in which he goes after you know, everything from uh, the federal government to journalism, the IRS, um, uh, the United Nations didn't exist yet, but if they, if they did, he would be um, uh, after them as well. I mean, he, it's you could just as you read it, people start to at first when he's writing these things, people are like, oh, he's got some good ideas. That guy, within about four years of his political writing ramping up, and um, I have some. Um, uh, schizophrenia in my family uh, that leads to paranoia. So I I've, I've kind of know some of the symptoms. Um, you can see that dots are starting to connect for him. And he's starting to see everything connected in a large conspiracy against America. But then it makes that final shift, which is everything becomes a conspiracy against him, um, which is uh, often where kind of paranoid kind of visions lead us. We start to see kind of networking things together. We start to see causes and effect. Um, and eventually all of the kind of force of these networks begin to point directly at us. Now, again, as, as you and I touched on at the beginning, like, you know, because he's famous, because he is becoming a real thorn in FDR's side, um, you know, he's putting up money to try and defeat him in elections. He's taking out full page ads and newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, he's published self-publishing pamphlets and books um, decrying um, uh, Roosevelt and the New Deal. Um, FDR was, you know, you know, this is a, we have to remember about FDR. This is a guy who was, um, you know, there's a lot of good things that he did, but this is a guy who also you know, interred, you know, Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, and by all accounts, he could be a vindictive son of a bitch. And so he, he, we know for a fact that he regularly used the IRS as a, as a tool for targeting political enemies. And he definitely did that um, with Crosby. So Crosby begins along with some other folks. I mean, Crosby wasn't the only one. Other people uh, begin to get targeted who were, um, you know, using, um, uh, in Crosby's case, um, Crosby was um, a pioneer as a businessman cartoonist in that he very early on creates a limited liability corporation for Skippy. Um, and uh, he saw some of the benefits and powers of licensing very quickly with Skippy. And we haven't talked about peanut butter yet, which we will double oh, back but, to. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so he early on, he creates a limited liability company um, and um, protects himself, but also protects his assets in the way limited liability corporations are designed to do, uh, protects some of his profits, um, has some of the things that he creates and owns are owned by the corporation instead of by him. And he was taking advantage of the tax code in ways that rich celebrities do all the time today. We take it for granted that, um, you know, if you're, if you're wealthy enough as uh, a musician, for example, or a movie star, you create these corporations that, um, you know, kind of basically kind of limit some of the personal liability and tax burden on you as an individual. He was doing that. He was taking advantage of, of uh, tax laws in a way that uh, was legal, as far as I can tell, and I've had some tax folks look at, at what we can find of his documentation. It was legal, but it was fairly um, cutting edge at the time. Um, frankly, there just, you know, weren't um, the idea of a, a cartoonist and artist 
making enough money to be able to uh, manage his, his economics in this way was was fairly new. And what the IRS did is they waged a war against him in the press. They were like, look what this cartoonist is doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and it works, right? It begins to kind of sour Crosby's image in the public imagination that even though what he was doing was probably kosher, certainly it wouldn't be something that would ever be um, challenged today. Um, the, it was easy to kind of, particularly after the depression, um, to kind of paint him as this kind of uh, self-entitled millionaire who was dodging his tax responsibilities. So yeah, he also had some reason to feel targeted, but I think it's important just in terms of the narrative. And I don't think this really comes through entirely in in uh, Jerry Robinson's version because there are things that you know. Obviously, I had access to things. Um, through newspaper databases and stuff that's come online since yeah. since Jer- Jerry's day uh, that he wouldn't have had. But it's I think it's also important to say, you know, I don't want to say he brought it on himself, right? Because nobody deserves to be targeted by the IRS. But I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, he made enough of a nuisance of himself um, that, and, and I, I'm quite sure that, um, that FDR's administration went to King Features and tried to get him fired there, too. There's evidence of that. But he had, by the time that happened, he had already worked himself up into quite a lather. And, you know, I think it's obviously, you know, we defend and should defend First Amendment uh, rights, but it's hard not to read some of this material um, from this period. Um, And I'd be a little... A little shocked by it. I, I can send you some of these. Um, let me see if I can pull up some of uh, some of these titles. I cover some of these in, in volume three and four. Um, uh, there's um, they start off again pretty good. I think it's called "Hooray for the Red, uh, the Red, Red and Red." Um, let me see if I let me see if I can get the title. They, they um, so we have "Hooray for the Red, White and Blue" that later gets replaced by, I gotta get Crosby's full bibliography here because it's so good. Um, his, I really actually, when I first started reading his stuff, I was like, you know, his politics are, are conservative, but a lot of cartoonists were, um, you know, anti-FDR conservatives during this period. Yeah. This is a period, for example, where Al Cap and- uh, yeah, Gray. And, yeah, Gray, Frank King, um, uh, Chester, Chester Gould. Gould. Yeah. yeah, these guys. These guys were all anti-FDR conservatives. It was. Mm-hmm. We think of cartoonists today as being pretty progressive, but that was that was not the case back then. Like they yeah. were, they tended to skew um, uh, for whatever reason. Um, actually, I'd love to do more thinking about that. But they tended yeah. to skew the I'd other direction. In, I'd be interested in you doing more thinking about that because <laughs> it is kind of curious. Yeah. yeah, I've I've always wanted to write a book about um, about uh, kind of the conservative comic strip in the 20s and 30s. Um, yeah. It does begin to shift after the 50s when you start getting either you know kind of um, kind of centrist um, uh, kind of subdued politics like Schultz or um, you know m- more left leaning politics uh, like Walt Kelly after the war. Um, you get fewer um, newspaper comic strips that are as explicitly uh, political on the right as you would see in the 20s and 30s. Something something shifts there in the culture of cartooning. Um, so here's, I'll, and I'll, I could shoot you over a bunch of them. Would communism work in the in America is um, one of his earlier ones, and it's yeah, yeah. it's actually. It's actually pretty thoughtful, right? He's just oh, like, these, oh no, these are essays and magazines or something, or what? No, uh, these are books. Sorry, would communism work in America is later. I get them. Um, so here's, I'll just give you some titles. You can find them all actually at archives.org, okay. uh, or most of them, not all of them. But um, um, he has um, uh, there's would communism work in America? There's oh, there's not as many up here as there used to be. Um, I should have gathered some of these other ones. They mostly have his World War I stuff up here. Um, I, and all my, unfortunately, all my volumes um, are at, locked down at the university, so I don't have access oh, to them at the moment. Okay. Um, otherwise, I'd be, I'd be pulling them up. 
Um, um, I, they're on those PDFs I sent you. But yeah. and he also is writing some of the most crazy stuff. Though he's writing is in um, uh, is is some of the stuff he's writing for newspapers. Um, again, these are classified ads. He's taking out whole pages. Uh, and I think he's staying up all night, you know, on caffeine and booze and rage. And he's writing, and he's a he's a really good writer. So you know, and he's he's an angry polemicist, and he is becoming increasingly fearless um, in a way that is um, just kind of literally scorched earth in terms of his well, uh, connections that, to the outside world. How does that happen? Is he like emboldened by his own celebrity? He's just thinking no, he if if anything, he's becoming more and more isolated during this period. Um, I think you know this is again. You know, as things are starting to unravel in the second half of the 30s for him, after kind of second marriage ends, um, and I, I wish I had all my my notes here so I could get the dates exactly right. Um, and as Roosevelt was running yet again, um, as um, war is getting closer once again, um, he is um, uh, kind of, you know, he's not going to New York anymore. His friends are like, we never see you. We never see Percy anymore. It even becomes something that shows up in some of the society columns of the day. Like nobody sees Crosby anymore. He's always at his farm. Um, um, and I think there's just a, a way in which, as happens, his kind of sense of persecution, his sense that only I see what's actually happening out there, right? Nobody else is seeing it. Mm. And, you know, there's, you know, again, where does that turn from being, you know, kind of, political visionary to kind of paranoid, um, you know, kind of isolated alcoholic, you know, it's a thin line probably for all political visionaries. Yeah. Uh, at, at some point he crosses over and um, there's, you know, his strip, his personal life, his physical health, everything by the end of the thirties into the early forties, everything starts to um, deteriorate pretty quickly. Um, and when, when does he start? Uh, when does he start picking a fight with the mob? So, so well, yeah, let's back up there. So much to part, talk about with this guy, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's the other part of the conspiracy, right? So now we got to go back to twenty five, um, <laughs> um, and um, now we got to talk about peanut butter, which, you know, frankly, I I hesitate um, always to talk about peanut butter and Crosby because. Um, I worked very closely on these books, um, Dean Mullaney and I did, with his daughter, um, who passed away very recently. Um, she was um, a great woman, a fearless defender of, um, of her father's legacy um, and of um, his uh, struggle against, in particular, she did not share his politics, um, um, but um, she shared very strongly his sense of injustice, uh, and particularly the sense that um, that Crosby and and the family had been robbed by first by um, the uh, the really devious and loathsome um, manufacturer. Um, who first patented um, Skippy uh, peanut butter and then violated all cease and desist orders. Um, and then by the companies who subsequently uh, and knowingly picked up Skippy peanut butter. Um, uh, for much of her adult life, she was fighting Unilever before Unilever sold the Skippy brand. Um, and she spent an immense amount of energy, an immense amount of personal money um, fighting this case. Uh, I don't believe she ever was thinking, oh, you know, we're going to make a lot of money. It was really um, something that kind of deeply got under her skin as um, a cause that she was going to devote her life to. Um, and, um, you know, I actually, you know, quite sad. I need uh, that, you know, about her passing and sad that, you know, she never got to see even a glimmer of that uh, justice. Um, you know, there was... Um, I think one of the reasons that Crosby gets forgotten, um, and this is going to sound perhaps like a criticism of her as the trustee of his legacy, but I understand where she was coming from, even if I 
I regret the choices she made. One of the reasons Crosby is forgotten to history, there are several reasons. One is that kind of King features and, you know, he gets locked away. He becomes a kind of embarrassment. Um, he has friends um, like Rube Goldberg and Charles Schultz um, who are uh, trying to keep his memory alive, but it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's very hard um, and changes. There's a change as well in the style of cartooning. His strip looks old fashioned by the time we get into the fifties and sixties. Um, and, um, and you, by this point, there are also kind of more and more stories of Percy Crosby is crazy, right? So Percy Crosby is crazy becomes the narrative of Percy Crosby. Um, and the reason I, again, just to back up a second, the reason I say we can say he struggled with some mental health issues without saying he's crazy, because yeah. we don't use that language today, right? We, we recognize that mental health um, and mental illness is the same as any other illness. And we are very lucky to live in a time where we have increasing, increasingly less stigma around mental illness and increasingly more treatment options. But of course, that's remarkably modern. Um, I'm old enough to remember, for example, um, knowing several people who had electroshock therapy. Um, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, um, you know, the only treatment uh, for severe depression or uh, schizophrenia was like. Uh, unbelievably devastating drugs um, that basically made you non-functional. So, so much has changed, but so much of it is recent. Um, and the stigma around mental illness was so extreme that um, the very idea of a cartoonist having been institutionalized, uh, as Crosby is at the end of his life, against his will, and um, I think utterly unconscionably, just to be clear, okay. he, was meant to, he, he had mental illness, but he did not deserve uh, or need institutionalization and the um the the frankly the the work you see on the um uh, on the uh, uh, asylum in which he was imprisoned I, I think testifies to that but um you know it the other reason is because of the crosby family so joan crosby joan tibbetts crosby or joan crosby tibbetts excuse me um very much became um very anxious about his work uh, being used in any way that wasn't productive for um, her struggle for for justice for him, um, and so she who, she owned uh, most of the work. There's not a lot of original art out there in collections or or um, in auction houses, um, and she 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 kind of took very good care of it, but things didn't circulate, um, and she really wanted to control the story of her father. Um, you know, with with love and dedication, a deep sense that he had been wrong. But what that meant is, for decades, he, he was his work was out of the public eye. Um, it didn't get um, kind of reprinted during some of those earlier periods in which, for example, newspaper comics got reprinted. It remained. Um, so I think about, like, for example, the Bill Blackbeard's uh, Hyperion series in the, yeah. the 1970s. Um, is there, there's not a Skippy volume it, there, is in there? In the Smithsonian uh, book of newspaper there's, comics, there's one yeah. Sunday page in there. There's, there's one Sunday, and there was never a volume of, of no, so for example, never, yeah. so, so for me, my love of newspaper, old newspaper comics um, came about um, first when my dad was ripping up some linoleum in our old house in Brooklyn, and he found all of these um, kind of turn of the century newspapers moldering away under the linoleum uh, that I brought to my room. Um, and until um, I had to be dragged away with an asthma attack from the mold, oh. I, spent, I spent the day reading these old newspaper comics and I was just blown away. Um, and then um, I discovered just like a year later the Hyperion series was beginning to be published. And I would sometimes find it in like used bookstores. Um, and so I discovered, you know, Mutt and Jeff. I I discovered Happy Hooligan. Um, it was really the first time in the late '70s um, that you were starting to see things that um, had had really just kind of disappeared from public consciousness. And I just couldn't believe how good this stuff was. But mm. I didn't see Skippy. Like I, the only time I saw Skippy was like was when I read. Uh, Jerry Robinson's biography many years later that I picked up in a used bookstore. Um, and that's that began my obsession with Skippy. Uh, but he was, you know, there was partly because, you know, Joan trusted 
uh, Jerry Robinson to tell the story. And and he worked with her a lot on oh. that a project. And did she, um, growing up, did she think that her father was dead when he was institutionalized? Did, did she know he was locked away? Yeah, no, she did not. She learned about his institutionalization um, uh, uh, many years later when it was reported on the news that he had died. Um, oh, and yeah. so it had, been, it had been kept from her. Um, and it began, um, you know, she was already an adult by then, and it began her lifelong quest to, to know more um, about what happened to him. Um, and for her, the crux of the story, the injustice that broke him was peanut butter. Um, so that kind of backs us up to kind of the beginning of his story, which is, um, you know, that Crosby had an eye, um, and he wasn't a pioneer in this regard. There were obviously cartoonists before him who were very good with licensing. Um, we can think, for example, I mean, going back to um, Yellow Kid, um, obviously Outcult did not own uh, the copyright, but by the time of Buster Brown, yeah. Outcult did, right? So Outcult uh, was one of the first great visionaries. Um, you know, Bud Fisher was able to keep the copyright to uh, Mutt and Jeff through a, a, a little bit of a sleight of hand that he pulled when he left the Chronicle and went to uh, Hearst. Um, there were very few cartoonists. You could count them on, on one hand who mm -hmm. maintained complete control over merchandising rights and their own copyright. Crosby was one of them. Crosby had copyright. He owned Skippy. Um, and this was itself a big deal, right? Most cartoonists, as you know, I mean, the reason that um, that uh, Kniff walks away from Terry and the Pirates, which he loved, um, was because he didn't own it. Um, he didn't have control. So he went and he created um, another strip, Steve Canyon, that he could own. Um, it was very few cartoonists, though, achieve that degree of power uh, that they could actually own their strip and own the merchandising rights. Um, it actually, if anything, gets harder um, as you go uh, forward in history. So Crosby knew that he had something valuable. He had negotiated for this um, uh, fairly early when, and when he moved from um, his first, uh, he had a couple of small syndicates when he first starts. And when he moved over to Hearst, as everybody would eventually, you know, either at those days, if you wanted to, if you wanted big national distribution, you wanted to be with Hearst syndicate, uh, which kind of really ramps up in the, in the late teens and early twenties. Um, there was McClure's, there were others, but those were the two big ones that could get you in hundreds of papers. And he was able to maintain um, ownership um, with Hearst. By this point, Hearst had experience with a couple other cartoonists with similar deals. So, um, and he knew that, you know, that he had something valuable here, not just in terms of what he was paid for the strip, but he knew that the merchandising could be more valuable. Um, and for a while, it really was. So one of the things that Dean and I really cover in the books is trying to collect as much of the merchandising as we can because it's it's amazing. There were there were Skippy uh, sleds and and wagons and games and toys and clothes and dolls. Um, there was um, uh, uh, briefly, very briefly, although we've never been able to track down an episode, uh, Skippy radio show. Um, mm. There was um, Skippy was very effectively marketed under the um, uh, Skippy Inc. Limited Liability Corporation. Um, so when uh, Crosby gets word that this guy Rosenfeld is marketing a, a peanut butter called Skippy um, that uses the exact same logo and even the fence, um, he like calls up his lawyer, who's very good, um, and says, hey, send a cease and desist to this dude. Um, you know, they're doing this all the time. This isn't a, he doesn't think this is a big deal. Um, Rosenfeld, however, is, is a little bit connected um, and he fights back. Um, he had kind of come of age as a businessman in the world of kind of prohibition rum running in and around Chicago. So he's got connections um, and uh, they fight back, uh, but they lose. So Rosenfeld loses. Um, and the courts say, nope, you you don't have rights to do that. Like, you can't make Skippy peanut butter. <laughs> um, and Rosenfeld 
ignores um Rosenfeld keeps going and uh Crosby I think at first they were like, just assumed, well, this guy will go away like everybody else goes away. So they weren't paying attention, but actually Rosenfeld, you know, I don't have the I, the timeline in front of me, but Skippy Peanut Butter becomes very successful um, and becomes increasingly a national brand. Um, gets um, kind of, uh, I think fairly quickly even gets sold, becomes a, a, a larger business. And one of the, one of the challenges in terms of uh, this kind of law that I've learned is uh, you got to strike quickly, right? Before your rival has kind of made something of it. And that's why Crosby immediately would do these cease and desist letters. But by ignoring him, Rosenfeld was able to keep uh, Skippy peanut butter going long enough for it to become uh, a real thing in and of itself. Oh. In, in the, and so the courts then become much more hesitant um, and much more ambivalent um, about um, the the kind of the kind of going after Rosenfeld. And uh, for a variety of reasons, Crosby becomes increasingly convinced that the mob is backing um, is oh. backing Rosenfeld. Now, you know, Joan Crosby, found um, pretty convincing evidence. I've seen the evidence she found that would point to um, uh, definitely some connections, right? There are definitely some business connections there. Um, you know, whether the the kind of the mob was specifically backing Rosenfeld um, to get at Crosby is a matter of, um, I think, speculation. I totally get why she believes it. Um, and the main reason she believes it is because Crosby, alone of almost anybody in um, in kind of newspaper cartooning at the time, made Al Capone um, not just a target, but a subject of ridicule in a long running um, arc, his first longest running arc he did, uh, where Skippy's neighborhood essentially gets taken over by um, a young little mobster who wears a little diamond pin, which is at once a kind of, you know, making fun of Al Capone as a little, by infantilizing him. Also a shout back to um, Thomas Nass takedown of Boss Tweed in the 19th century, something that, that Crosby deeply admired um, Nass um, as somebody who used uh, cartooning as a, a tool for reformist politics. So, this this wasn't just a one-off, right? There's a whole thing. So the mob comes in, they're going to kill Skippy. They take over the town. There's extortion rackets. It's not subtle, right? It's like, it is ridiculing and making fun of Capone. And it's it's in Chicago papers, right? So, oh, shit. you know, Capone, the mob saw this and I'm sure they didn't love it. So, you know, I think Joan, Joan's belief that, the mob was also interested in, um, and at the very least, bloodying Crosby's nose is not far-fetched at all. Um, and, um, you know, I actually, I think very few of her theories, even when, um, you know, sometimes she herself was trying to kind of connect dots that were pretty distant because she didn't have access to a lot of the records. But they're all, they were all plausible and reasonable. As a biographer, I couldn't, I couldn't run with all of them in text, and sometimes it would, it would make her sad that I didn't because I had to say I don't have the evidence. Fortunately, she got to tell her own version of the story um, in a really, I think, uh, articulate way in a in a volume um, that she did for um, um, uh, for that was called Skippy versus the Mob. Um, oh, did that get published? I, it did, yeah. It kind of a very small run, sadly, and I, uh -huh. I think it was a frustrating experience for both her and the publishers. Um, you know, it's it's um her desire to really focus on peanut butter sometimes could be make her frustrating. I think to work with, and so I, I think that wasn't necessarily the the greatest relationship, but the volume is really valuable because it's to me it's the best unedited version of. Um, I'll see if I can find a copy and I can send it to you. Oh, um, it's, oh, it's are those scripts reprinted in any of the volumes of Skippy that you did with IDW? No, but we did give her, um, because um, there were some parts of, the, of her version of the story that as, you know, as a biographer, I feel 
you know, I, I feel bound by certain kind of, you know, biographers, um, ethics to have sources. Um, and it's a little like journalistic ethics for me as a biographer. Um, I, I need to have uh, corroboration, right? So there were a lot of things that she gave me that I was like, that sounds right. But I couldn't find, I would just say to her, I can't find probably because, you know, some of them would have been things that would exist only in, you know, the mob's archives or in, um, you know, other places like including, you know, the FBI's archives. There were things that just were beyond my access. So oh, we okay. gave her some space to tell some of it herself. Too. Uh, but the strips themselves, the Skippy versus the mob story. That's that, all there. Yeah. That's it. That's reprinted in which volume is it? That, that is in, if I'm remembering correctly. And again, I don't have them in front of me. I think that's in volume two. Um, but I can double check, and and I sent you all the volume too, so you should have that oh, cool. yeah, in yeah. your mail. I love I'd love to read that. Yeah, it's an amazing it's an amazing story, and it's just great cartooning, and it's great. I mean, it's really the moment where you know he is like, I'm going to get pretty serious about, um, you know, using my strip um, to kind of do more than just kind of do this kind of slice of life, kind of you know, kind of half Tom Sawyer, half, you know, philosopher uh, kid that I've created and start actually kind of getting into some um, social issues and political issues. Um, and, you know, we know that uh, there were periods where um, Crosby um, saw people on his land. Um, he um, heard guns fired on his land. Uh, the FBI was involved. Um, Hoover, um, uh, who... Uh, you know, shared some politics with Crosby. Um, Hoover actually kind of told, you know, ordered the FBI to investigate. Uh, they took it seriously. Um, so, you know, again, it's it's like the worst cocktail for somebody who's got perhaps some minor challenges in terms of mental illness, yeah. um, has a real sense of um, kind of being a missionary. Like he really was a crusader. He was a kind of Don Quixote uh, saw himself as a lone crusader um, in a world of of corruption and ignorance. Um, and, you know, you mix in there alcohol, too much money, and increasing isolation. Um, it's a bad cocktail. And it kind of goes the way, in retrospect, um, one would expect it to. Um, but the the peanut butter story became increasingly frustrating for him, both because he saw it as um, the influence of the mob, um, he saw um, uh, uh, that the, the peanut butter um, was being, he believed it was being protected, not just by the mob, but also increasingly came to believe it was being protected by Roosevelt um, and by um, uh, kind of that the failure to protect his personal property was a sign of the moral decay of the country, right? This was itself, I think, part of his kind of changing politics, the institutions of the United States that he believed in had failed him. And so as a result, he began to kind of set himself up as a kind of, you know, kind of Cassandra there, um, kind of kind of saying, the, you know, everything is about to end if we don't kind of change. And his own experiences became one of his primary sources of evidence. So in a lot of his political writings, he's talking about things that are happening to him. Um, and uh, that made it even easier for his opponents to just paint him as kind of crazy and self-indulgent. Um, but again, there was some reason for it. He began eventually to see the, a deep connection between the mob and FDR himself. Wow. So that was the kind of final falling into place of the pieces. The peanut butter had kind of unlocked a larger vision for him of the kind of corruption and rot in American government and American politics. Um, and I really do think that once he, when he lost his faith in America, um, that kind of as as kind of an institution, um, I, I think uh, a kind of a kind of darkness and depression really settled over him. Um, and um, you know, by all accounts, like even friends would describe in some of the correspondence I found towards you know the end of the thirties. Um, that like hanging out with him was getting to be really hard, um, yeah. you know, because he was obsessed, right? He couldn't talk or think about anything else. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, even the people who loved him most 
were needing to keep more and more distance. Um, so if you look at his his kind of final writings, he turns he's increasingly isolated. Um, he gets increasingly invested, really for the first time, in spirituality. He, I mean, Skippy had always really been interested in religion. Um, a lot of early Skippy strips are preaching for, um, you know, that all religions, all pathways to God are good. Um, and uh, they're very, in some ways, very kind of progressive and deeply invested in freedom of religion. Um, and he himself, even if he, as he starts becoming more interested in religion and Christianity, he's not he's not a church member. He's very much interested in a kind of private Christianity. Um, and he's kind of like a lot because partly through his isolation, his distrust of institutions, he's kind of going his own way. So a lot of his final writings, um, a lot of which weren't published, but which which Joan and the family have that um I'm hoping maybe that they'll they'll be willing to share sometime because actually they're quite beautiful. Yeah. Are re really thinking more about kind of you know about spirituality, about ethics, about some of the things that really motivated him early on. Um, once he kind of you know in some ways kind of let go of the politics. Once he no longer had the strip, um, even after he is um, uh, institutionalized. Um, uh, you can see um, in some of the documents that Joan shared with us that he would send uh, back uh, from the from the institution. Um, they're they're quite thoughtful and um, and very moving. Um, his the anger, the rage is is really gone. Uh, the most of the rage he feels now is the rage of being unfairly locked up. Yeah. Um, now he believed, and his daughter believed that he was locked up to protect Skippy peanut butter. Mm -hmm. And I will just tell you, um, and um, and I mean no disrespect to Joan or the family, I, I could find no evidence to support that. Um, I think in, in my reading, I, I, was, I'm, I was so loyal to Joan for so long that I hesitate, I hesitate to say on the record anything that kind of puts distance between me and her. But um, I looked hard for it. I could not find evidence to support that. Um, I, I think a lot of people were, first of all, a lot of people were unfairly imprisoned in institutions during this period. Um, institutionalization was often a solution used for people who were, who were just difficult. Um, and by all accounts, he could be difficult, right? So uh, I'm so glad that's not anymore or I'd be institutionalized because, <laughs> you know, I, I can be difficult. Lots of us can be difficult. Well, but... let's talk about how he got institutionalized in the first place. Yeah. He, he, so his, what I understand is that his strip was canceled and that was kind of the beginning of a spiraling down. Yeah. His mother died, right? Yeah. Then he was divorced. Yeah. And he tried to commit suicide and then that failed attempt landed him in yeah. the institution. And so, it was, it was from what I can tell about the suicide attempt, which was widely covered in the papers. Um, it looks to me more like uh, a kind of cry for help um, attempt. Okay. Um, it doesn't look like um, somebody who wanted to die, but somebody who wanted help. Of course, the help he got um, was the worst kind of help. Um, <laughs> yeah, much help. And, yeah, and um, and he would never ever um, be uh, released. Um, and he petitioned for his release, um, and uh, the family uh, worked for his uh, release. Um, the um, the um, struggle on the part of um, the um, the family to uh, get him out of um, the institution um, the uh, is um, you know they would bring in for example um, in the fight and actually I got one huge detail wrong and Joan will tell this story better in. Um, in Skippy versus the mob. So you can double check yeah. these dates. She learned about, she learned about, oh, now I'm getting these dates wrong. I'm sorry. Wish I had my books. Cause she was involved in, um, in, yeah, I think she learned about him when he died and then was um, kind of struggling uh, on behalf of uh, his legacy and his rights to Skippy peanut butter by bringing in 
people like Charles Schultz to testify. Um, and so I actually didn't get those entirely wrong. But um, earlier on, as you, I think, as, as you mentioned on Facebook, um, cartoonists had gone to visit him. I think, well, only Goldberg, I think, really went to visit him. But people were concerned. People asked about getting him out. He petitioned to get out. But his then wife um, and, uh, the, and the, the kind of legal trustees of his estate uh, denied, kind of basically said he should stay in. What Joan believed, and again, maybe it's true, I just couldn't find the evidence and maybe I just didn't have it. Um, uh, maybe I didn't look in the right place. Joan believed that the lawyer, um, and there was definitely evidence that the lawyer who was in charge of his estate was um, a really bad lawyer um, and probably not a good human being. But she believed that him and the then wife uh, were in cahoots kind of with the peanut butter to kind of keep him locked up in a way. So he could not kind of interrupt the big sales and moves that were happening um, in terms of the industry. In the post-war period, um, peanut butter industry really did explode. It became huge business um, for a number of reasons. So, you know, again, I, it's possible. I just couldn't find it. And I, something in my gut tells me that by that point, the peanut butter company was pretty sure they were safe. Um, but I, you know, I could be wrong. Um, yeah. But he, he, you know, he rightfully believed that he was wrongfully imprisoned, that he was institutionalized against his will. Um, I think he knew well his problems and his weaknesses, but I think he also knew well, you know, the depths of his strength. Um, but, uh, you know, he couldn't obviously uh, win. Um, and again, the stigmas against mental illness at this time and, and against suicide um, as a kind of sign of weakness and madness um, were intense. So, you know, one of the last works that we, um, we kind of know he created is this remarkable mural in the walls, uh, the basement walls of the institution. Um, we know he had access to painting supplies. Um, he became very interested in portraiture. Um, and I think it's important to mention, which I didn't mention anywhere along the lines, that um, he also was, in the 1920s especially, uh, a widely celebrated and exhibited painter of fine art as well. Yeah. Um, he published a couple of, of, of volumes of, of prints. Um, he had several big exhibits. Mm -hmm. um, the Guggenheims bought a bunch of his work. Um, there was a real moment in his life where he was... Um, he had a movie made of Skippy. He had exhibitions. He was a, a best-selling author, and he had Skippy. Like this yeah. guy was—he yeah. was the—he was—he was winning an EGOT or whatever the equivalent of an EGOT yeah. would have been. So he kind of retreated into painting and drawing. Um, and you know, from the little we know about his life in the institution, um, and into kind of philosophy and ethics. Um, and you know, I like to hope or imagine. Um, as miserable as the conditions were in which I'm, I'm sure he lived and died in his final years, that he found some peace in that. Um, yeah. the, but, you know, um, you know, of course, that work itself, um, as, as Julia Wirtz told me a few years ago, was also destroyed um, when the institution was torn down. Um, and, um, you know, it's it's heartbreaking. Fortunately, we have um, uh, some good photographs on, on the web of, of the murals that yeah. survived. There was no way to really save it, though, was there? Maybe I mean, was... with with care and attention, um, yeah, it could have been saved. But, um, you know, it it's, was a property that was kind of vacant for so long. I mean, Caitlin uh, McGurk described kind of growing up with it just being kind of a place there that, you know, people would go and break into. Um, I think Julia, who did a lot of urban exploring, she said she also spent time visiting there. Um, so that's why we have these photographs. People would go and take pictures of it. But I don't, I think people thought, oh, it'll be here forever. Um, and when the decision came to tear it down, um, uh, there was nobody aware of it until it was till it was gone. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges with with Crosby in general is that we have somebody whose final final decades were spent locked away, um, whose work was kept out of the public eye, 
Um, literally, I can't think of another cartoonist who reached the heights of fame and visibility as close to a household name um, of anybody working in kind of cartooning that you can think of, except for, you know, a handful of others in this period. Um, and then lost everything. I mean, his his movie based on Skippy won an Oscar. Um, there aren't many movies based on comics that have won Oscars, right? It's uh, <laughs> find it on DVD. I was looking for a copy of it to watch. Yeah. I couldn't. I have it. a copy. I'll send it to you. It's it's good. Oh, yeah, it's, love it's, it. it's, it's got really Jack good. Coogan. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, no, it, they did a nice job with it. Um, it's they and there was a a, a follow up movie as well. Um, and uh, the book is fun too. And um, the second book he wrote, um, fiction book he wrote, is called Suki. Um, it's about his friend Suki. I don't know if you've spent a lot of time with the strip, but mm -hmm. Suki is his friend who's incredibly poor, um, like living in, in incredible precarity. Uh, and uh, the family um, struggles for food. This family struggles for shelter. Um, and it's a really moving meditation on... Um, you know, on the injustice of poverty, on, you know, I, you know, the kind of on the, the kind of the dignity of those who are um, living under such conditions. Um, it's, you know, this is the side of, of Crosby that, you know, up until the end, I always admired, even as, um, you know, a lot of his politics became more and more vicious and vile, um, you know, the, his core humanity uh, remained intact. Um, he just saw enemies everywhere. But he he was always, I believe, um, and you know, some people might disagree with me here. I think if Gary Groth were listening to this, he would he might disagree. But I do believe that even as paranoid as he was towards the end about seeing all this conspiracy against him, he did believe that the reason they were against him was because he was fighting for the dispossessed. He was fighting for the common man. He was fighting for, you know, small town, kind of rural poor. He, he saw himself as this crusader. I don't think small town, rural poor necessarily saw him as their crusader, but he sure. really believed that. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the world that Skippy comes out of. When he was, he was given an opportunity to create his first, um, he, was to cre he, had, he had already made a kid's strip that was moderately successful. And when he was given an opportunity to create Skippy, he, um, described walking around all night and into the morning, just looking at kids, um, you know, in the Bowery and on the streets and, you know, a, a little bit like out cults vision of the poor, right? This is um, in the yellow kid, right? This is a world he had, a, he really kind of was always believed that kids can triumph over their environments. Um, and that, you know, we, we tended to paint um, poverty as crushing and destroying people, but the resilience of kids was always a site of promise and hope. Um, and so he kind of came up with the whole kind of vision of Skippy, even though Skippy is a solidly middle-class kid with you know, a professional father and, um, and, a, and a stable house, he came up with it from kind of walking around and looking at you know, what he would have called in those days street urchins, um, and being inspired by these kids. Um, and so, you know, that part of, of him, um, you know, that's the part that I think even in his darkest time remained intact. Um, he did really have kind of optimism in people. He just grew to just trust every institution. Um, and he, I think he, you know, it's kind of, I don't know how you, how you could hate every institution and still believe in people because um, people are, you know, people are part of those institutions. But I think he really did. He saw them as separate things. So how many volumes of Skippy did you do for IDW? We did four before um, before we had to bring it to an end. Um, it was um, much to um, our disappointment um, and um, I think even more to Joan's disappointment. It was not financially successful. Um, they, they, they won, they were nominated for two Eisners, um, which is a great honor. Um, I, they were very well critically received. Um, I think we made some new, uh, fans and friends of Skippy. Um, yeah. but you know, I think it was also coming towards the tail end of this kind of golden age of newspaper comic strips and Skippy had been out of the public eye so long, um, that it was, I think, uh, a big ask in retrospect to 
kind of hope, although I just assumed anybody opens this up, they're going to be like, I must own this. But yeah. it was a big ask at that point when um, people's, you know, newspaper comic budgets were already getting taxed um, uh, to expect people to invest in a comic strip that very few people had heard of. Right? This was not yeah. Barnaby. This was not Little Orphan Annie. Right? This was a strip that had um, really, you know, even though Barnaby was obviously had many fewer papers, there was a legend to kind of Crockett, Johnson and Barnaby and um, and obviously, you know, Crockett Johnson goes on and does Harold and the Purple Crayon, whereas, you know, Crosby goes on and gets institutionalized. So yeah. it's it was uh, I mean, I'm glad they're there. They're in libraries. They're in, in collections. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, they'll inspire a new generation. Uh, but our, our fantasy of being able to do uh, all of them is at least it's on hiatus. Um, that's officially we're not saying it's canceled, but. It's on hiatus. How many um, would there have been? There would have been altogether. There would have been. Let me see if I can get this right. I think there would have been seven because we would have. He he. Towards the very end, he starts repeating himself a, a little bit. Oh. Um, I think he's struggling. Um, and so um, we could have actually combined the last four years into one volume oh. um, by eliminating the reprint. So it would have been seven volumes altogether. Um, I do, I will say, I think we got, I would have loved at least one more volume, because I think there's still some really good work, but um, by the time you get in the 40s, the work is is definitely, it's, it's um, as I said, it's stiffer, it loses that crackling energy, and it loses the joy and exuberance and optimism. It becomes, uh, Skippy as a kind of mouthpiece for Crosby, becomes darker and more pessimistic and, and more preachy. Um, so it's, um, I was, I was always a little worried about the last couple of volumes anyway. So it's not the end of the world. We got the, the good stuff is out there. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's let's end it here. Awesome. Uh, and thank you very much for talking about Skippy for so long. That was great. Absolutely. <laughs> I apologize for any facts I got wrong because um you know not having the books here. So um right. just c- kind of give a little um a uh, little warning to if you don't mind just let your 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 viewers know that um, I was separated from my library, so um, right. any facts uh, that I got wrong, I can I can try and fix later uh, mm-hmm. when I'm back to my library. Mm-hmm.